All right, guys, welcome to the podcast. Today, we are honored and privileged to have Corey Russell with us. Corey, thanks for being on here today. Man, I'm glad to be with you guys. It's an honor. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Corey, you are just, you have such a heart for intercessory prayer. And would you just share a bit of your story, how you came to have that passion? Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm originally from Northwest Arkansas. And uh, long story short, you can probably find it on YouTube or whatever, but I had a radical salvation out of drugs hmm. and all of the stuff. And had an intense encounter February 18th, 1997 in a college parking lot in Northwest Arkansas. And immediately born again, delivered, set on fire. And within a month, I had a drug ring of friends that began to uh, have encounters and salvations like that. And, uh, um, and so we began to see a move of God in our hometown. The first six months were about five meetings a week till three in the morning. <laughs> and I led my brother to the Lord who led half the high school to Jesus. And we just got in do and just fully submerged into a culture of revival awakening. But I really began to connect the dots from an early season that what I was experiencing was the result of someone else's prayers. And so I began to connect actually with my best friend's mom and her best friends. And so I'm a 20 year old guy right out of the world. And I kid you not, my first two years, I hung out the majority of my time with two 50 year old ladies and one 80 year old woman. Oh, and, wow. and these girls taught me how to pray. I, they taught me about laboring and praying and giving myself to the place of prayer. Cause I think from day one, it was just in me, this longing of proximity to be close to God and to feel his heart, to pray his heart and to agree with his heart to seeing others impacted by it. And so I really gravitated towards these women. They taught me how to pray and it just fed this insatiable hunger inside of me to one, be in the presence of God all the time. Hmm. Two, to minister to him and then out of the overflow of ministering to him to pray with him yeah. and to seeing people's lives changed. And so that was my early years. And I spent two years doing that and then really began to connect to what God was doing in Kansas City at the International House of Prayer. Mm -hmm. And uh, it had been going on, uh, started in 99, but I really began to track with them. And about 15 months in after graduating from college i me and my wife i got married in 98 me and my wife just felt an insatiable hunger to go give ourselves to become intercessory missionaries to make this a full-time uh calling and job on our life this is what i wanted to do with my life wow. and so it was just you i just kept feeding it and feeding it and feeding it and so those were the early days that kind of led me into it yeah yeah I know one of the things that, uh, that I see right now is I just see and hear more and more church leaders um, being just drawn into a desire to pray for revival, really waking up to the sense that as far as the American church goes, we, we've seen church in our own power. And yes. hunger for revival and pressing. What, what do you think is happening in this moment that's kind of waking that up? I think the Lord's wearing the church down. Wow. I think the Lord is wearing us down after all of our activities, our own wisdom, our own strategies, living in our own giftings and abilities to, to touch and reach people. And I think he's calling us to the core foundation of apostolic community, apostolic ministry and power. And it's a reconnection in the place of prayer, both individually and corporately. And that's what I'm, you know, I'm doing. A, one of the big things that's gripped my life has been that the disciples were in every revival service for three and a half years with Jesus. They saw every miracle, heard every message, witnessed every deliverance. And we don't see one recorded time where they asked him, teach us to preach or teach us to heal or teach us to deliver. Yeah. They go, we want your prayer life. Teach us to pray. And so I believe that it's, one, Jesus had to live a life that provoked that question, yeah. number one. And number two, it's begun to tell me as a leader, is my life provoking that in the ones around me the most? And wow. so I believe that we're in the midst of a church issue of a lack of prayer because our leaders 
for the most part, are prayerless. Our shepherds are prayerless. We've become professionals at preaching, at all the other things, the outward fruits. But I believe we need leaders again that are leading our prayer meetings and that are building cultures of prayer and that are one embodying it because you can't take people where you haven't been. Yeah. And so I, I think it's a, it's a wake up call. I believe we're seeing the resurgence of it because the Lord's whittling us down because prayer is a beggarly calling and it takes a while to get humble enough to pray. Yeah. And, and I think God is, is one starving us out. We're running out of options. And I think it's, we're actually going to begin to discover uh, the things we're longing for, but in a different way than we thought we'd get there. Yeah. When you say that, that God is, that God's wearing us down. Um, what, can you unpack that a little bit? What do you think that looks like? I mean, I think, I, I think it's, it can be several things. One is, fruitlessness. It's two things. When I think about God wearing us down, I think God exposing that after all of our strategies, our plans, our ideas for church growth or for this or for that or for this, that at the end of the day, it's not truly answering what we thought would get us there, true impact, or the worst thing. I think it says in Psalm 105 or six, it says that God answered their request, but sent leanness into their souls. Wow. Which, which means this, you have big churches, but your souls are dying. Because if you evaluate how success by how big, how much, and how many, then you find so many leaders that are bankrupt. We find ourselves that are bankrupt, and we've, we've sold something along the way to, to, to keep people in seats with a lesser than full gospel. Yeah. And I, I, I'm grateful. I love Lord. It's not about big versus little. I mean, day of Pentecost saw 3000 saved. I mean, heck, there's a mega church. Yeah. I'm not against mega. I, and God's in the mega and I'm believing for a billion soul harvest, but it's mega. What, yeah. what is the content? What's the DNA? Is it a life taking up the cross and following him? Is it a life of humility? And so I think, I think when God's wearing us down, I think God's bringing us back to the gospel. I think God's bringing us back to living on our knees, hmm. lives of humility, lives of sacrifice, lives of the cross, the given life. And so I think God's bringing us back to humility at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, man, that's powerful. That's powerful. And that, you know, one of the things that, uh, that I think of just listening to you talk is, uh, you see so many leaders burning out. I mean, every single day, it seems like we, we see another story of a leader that made, you know, sacrifice their integrity, some kind of decision and horrible, horrible stories. And it just seems like every day there's those kind of things. What does that, what does that say about the kind of power just that, that the leaders themselves, that we as leaders of the church, that we are trying to walk in when this is, it just seems like it's at an epidemic level. Well, I think it's another symptom of the, that's what I'm talking about, the leanness into the souls. Yeah. Because we're finding that big churches still won't answer that. I think it's, and it pains me because I understand the pressures of leadership. I think a lot of our systems and our cultures are built in these men most of the time they're men, they get on islands and it's isolation, no accountability. Uh, they, that's their only place of safety. They can't talk to anybody. They've been put in such a, a room alone that they can't even navigate. And then, it, then the fault lines start breaking when the pressures of people's demands and their own lack of connection with God and their own boredom with God begins to come to the forefront. You hit midlife and all the 10 things begin to happen. But I think it's another symptom uh, that we've been living disconnected from the place of prayer, from the place of connection around prayer and building, uh, building uh, and making the prayer meeting the most famous meeting of the week and putting prayer back at the center. Yeah. I think it's another symptom that's to call us saying, God, raise up leaders that can go there and that can begin to build in that place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what would you say to the leader who maybe watches this, hears this, you know, reads some, read your book or, and they just find themselves in that place. Their soul is lean. 
and they know they are tapped out. Uh, yes. what, would, what, what would you say to them? They are leaned into what you're saying. They say, Corey, I, I, I need this. Where do I start? What do I do? First off, man, I, the fact that you're even listening to this tells me just the state of your heart that you have a, you have a leaning in heart. First off, feel his pleasure. And then two, I just say, friend, come back to him. Just come back to your first love, Revelation 2. You know, Ephesus got 10 good things going on, but Jesus said, you know what? But I have this against you. You've left your first love. And we all know that. I know seasons where I've gotten busier for him than connection with him. And I know that when my ministry gets bigger than my heart and the pain of that, and like, God, I got to get back to doing what I did. So I think it's one, awareness. And that's the gift of God is to actually show you, God, I got to get back. God, I got to get back to, you know, effortless tears and the, the word alive and the spirit of prayer and just get back to the joy of walking with you, Jesus. And I think one, it's a simple step. It's just saying, Jesus, I'm, I'm returning. I, I'm returning. I want to go back and do first works. Jesus says, if you will not repent and do first works, there are first works. And I would just say to you as a leader, clear your schedule. I mean, heck, that's what God's given us with COVID. <laughs> he's just cleared it. Yeah. And he's saying, but th at the same time, the clearing actually exposes that all the excuses that we said aren't actually the excuses. Wow. That actually we're bored with him. And, uh, but I would say to you who are watching this, one step, friend. Wake up tomorrow morning, clear the schedule, and go on the journey of awkward, the breakthrough through awkwardness and boredom and lifelessness, and just lay there and just begin to rend your heart, pour your heart out to God, and begin to reach for him like you did in your early days, and I promise you he'll meet you. Lock yourself up with him and just say, I've got to find God again, and I promise you he will not, he you will not be disappointed. You will encounter him, I promise you. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yes. What would, so one of the things that you said um, is just the call to make the prayer meeting the biggest meeting of the week. So how, how would you, how would you even begin to go about something like that? Um, what, what, where, where would you start? How would you try to build that culture into, into a church? Yeah, I, I think, I think number one, leaders have to lead in prayer. Um, I think the leader has to lead I, at the prayer meeting. I think the number one thing is revelation. So I would begin series. I would begin teaching. I would begin preaching. I would begin, if you have a home group uh, model, let it filter through your home group system. Books that uh, uh, build prayer, that get revelation on the importance of prayer. And because I believe that faith is the outworking of revelation. And the most, most of the reason that people don't want to go to a prayer meeting is I can do better things with my time than sit in an empty room, tell an invisible God things he's already told me to tell him. And there's better things I can do with my time. And so we really don't believe it does anything. So we need to begin to give revelation of the power of prayer, the power of intercession, the power of ministry to God and how central it is us individually and us corporately. And I would one teach, two model it, call a prayer meeting and, and be there. As the leader, you're driving a stake in the ground. Tuesday night, Wednesday night, for a season, we're not gonna have normal Wednesday night meeting. We're gonna do it that, whatever. Or you're like saying, hey, we'll just do Tuesday nights. Um, whatever. But the biggest thing is you can't pass it on to the pastor of prayer. Uh, you have you have to be the pastor of prayer or you're not a true pastor yeah yeah and can you even get uh go into detail you do in your book on prayer uh, a little bit so at that prayer meeting what what would that prayer meeting look like what would what would you do great question in that environment? great question i love the power of music okay. music music is powerful i think get you a worship leader get you a you know, a handful of um, maybe as musicians and some singers and take the first 20 minutes and just worship him. Okay. Get people used to just worshiping God, singing well-known songs, uh, playing well-known songs. And what we did in Kansas City, is we, we walked through what we call the harp and bowl prayer model. But, you know, find your way. I think I think these are some of the important components is worship. 
Number two, lifting up the voice. Get the room used to spontaneous singing. Okay. Sing, singing in the spirit. Singing the Bible. That Ephesians 5. Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the spirit. Singing to one another. Psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Colossians 3, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you sing, um, singing to God. And then I believe in praying for revival. We're going to pray for revival in our city. We're going to pray for revival in our church, in the church of our city. I believe breaking, you know, and, and praying for our families, praying for the leadership. And there are apostolic prayers. There are prayers in the Bible that you can pray that God would intervene and send revival. At the end of the day, we need a move of the Holy Spirit. Wow. And I would just say, hey, let the leader lead out, have a group of intercessors and say, hey, now when I, you always lead it out by pouring out your heart. And there's a group, there's a list of apostolic prayers in the New Testament that Paul prayed. And I said, um, and then open it up for 10 to 15 second prayers for different people in the room to pour out their heart and do that for about 10 to 15 minutes and then go back into worship. And yeah. go back into worship, 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 and then go back into prayer for revival. Yeah. And and I would just do that, and I'd be faithful with that for a year. Wow. I wouldn't. I wouldn't try to rock the boat. Say, hey, not even try to add any more prayer meetings. And say, hey, we're going to do an hour prayer meeting, hour and a half, once a week for the next year, and we're going to be faithful with it. Yeah. And let it seep into the culture. Invite the parents to bring the kids. You make it a Tuesday night or if it's a Wednesday night and they're already coming to church. Try to find it a way to where it's already built into their schedule somewhat and just say, hey, bring the kids. Let them color in the back. Let them dance around. And we're going to have a prayer meeting and we're going to go after God. And I think just be consistent with it. You know, there's going to be seasons where the glory is falling and the new Jerusalem is breaking into the room. And there'll be other rooms that it's so boring that you're checking the clock every five minutes. The pay is the same. That's good. The pay is the same. So you're like, that's what it takes is you want to dig a well and you want to seep it into the culture. Yeah. And so that's what I've found in my life as far as, and the power of seeing it move because everybody wants immediate results. Yeah. This thing is a slow burn as ideologies are shifting, as a revelation is beginning to touch them. And begin to take on focuses. I imagine, I mean, you're, you're in Kentucky. I mean, we've seen drug addiction. We're seeing our kids lost. Yep. We're seeing, you know, all the, the epidemics of this generation. That's enough right there to pray mm-hmm. for our kids, to yep. pray for this generation that's left the church, that they would experience a move of God in our high schools. That's and that we would, I think those are good. Is there not a cause? There's a cause. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you said, you said it several times and we said it at the front, but I, I, I want to hear you unpack a little bit, Corey, what is intercessory prayer? Yeah. I mean, the, the, my main verse is Hebrews seven twenty five. Okay. Okay. And I just want to kind of remove a couple of myths and misconceptions about intercessors first. Okay. One is it's Hebrews seven twenty five. It says that Jesus forever lives to make intercession. That's good. Yep. Okay. Jesus is in full-time ministry right now. <laughs> okay. A lot of us just have him. He came, he died, he rose again, he ascended, and now he's on some lazy boy Wait until he comes back. Yeah. Jesus is in ministry right now, and you and I have been born mm. into that ministry. Wow. I, I'm grateful, and I do believe there's people who have cultivated the spirit of prayer, but I don't see the calling of an intercessor in the Bible. Mm-hmm other than Jesus is, and I believe that's to be every believer's new creation, new created calling. We're all partakers of that heavenly calling, and we're all been brought into an elevated place of proximity to God, to stand before God on behalf of men, and to stand before men on behalf of God. Wow. An intercessor is one who stands in the gap between two opposing parties for the purpose of reconciliation. Jesus is the perfect intercessor, okay? okay? He's the one that stood in the gap. He is making intercession right now at the right hand of the Father right now. How is Jesus making intercession? Is he rocking back and forth? Is he, what's he doing? 
I think there's three things in which Jesus is making intercession right now. I believe the fact that he's there, a man in the new Jerusalem is making intercession on behalf of humanity. I believe it says in Hebrews 9, 24, to appear in the presence of God for us. So we have an intercessor in heaven. Number two, his blood. Hebrews 12, 24, it says that his blood cries out a better word than that of Abel. And then number three, I believe his words. I believe Jesus is speaking words in the presence of the Father and that we as his body are joined together with him in this calling of showing up, of not quitting, and of bringing words. Yeah. And so intercessory prayer is, one is, you're like, well, that's not me. I'm more this person, more that person. This is another thing. It's not just a women's ministry. Wow. Most of us have relegated it to women. There's an, only one intercessor in heaven. It's not a woman. Hmm. Why do we say that? Because women do the service while the men do the real work. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus works as he prays. That's right. And it says in Hebrews 3, 1, that he is the apostle and the high priest of our confession, which means his apostolic or the, the, the work of the kingdom is birthed and is maintained and sustained out of his priestly calling of intercession. Yeah. So you and I are all intercessors. We stand. Hebrews 3, 1 says we're partakers of the heavenly calling. And that we're all priests and we're called to priests. That your first calling is priesting before God, ministering to God, looking at him, hearing him, speaking back to him, and fellowshipping with him. And out of overflow with his heart, we join with his heart for a broken world and for an ir a world that is irreconciled to him. And we long to reconcile it back to God. Wow. Yeah. And so when I think of intercessory prayer, it's a it's a it's when the Holy Spirit has you in the gap and you're in that place of pleading with God for for salvation or deliverance or a breakthrough or justice to come. When you're in the gap, that's when the spirit of intercessory prayer is operating through you. Wow. Corey, I think that you are the I think that you're the first person that I've heard. Uh, to say that. I know when I read your book and even just listen to you now, I'm pretty sure I, I, I've never heard anybody say that intercession is the new creation call of every single believer. Yes. How did we miss this? <laughs> so we wouldn't have to go to prayer meetings. <laughs> <laughs> and because it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel powerful. Okay. It doesn't feel successful. It, we don't feel immediate impact most of the time. Yeah. And I, and I think, and I believe that there are, I do believe that there are people with who, who are, you know, most of the time they are women because they're just, they're, they're more spiritually attuned, hmm. but I think there's wrong theologies. And I, and I believe we've got to cultivate priestliness again in the church. I think we've missed it because we have made what we do for God more impactful than who we are to God. Oh, wow. Yeah. 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 And so one of the things you, you've, you've said, uh, and you, you really drilled down on it a, a few moments ago when you were talking about what makes up the, the prayer meeting and that sort of thing, is praying God's word back to God. You even mentioned the prayers of the Apostle Paul and that sort of thing. Uh, unpack that for us. What, what does that look like to pray God's word back to God? Yeah, John 15, 7 is my main verse. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you'll ask whatever you desire and it will be given to you. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like to say it this way. This is what happens because I believe prayer doesn't begin with you talking. Okay. Prayer begins with you listening and receiving. And this is what happens is it begins with the Bible, a Bible open, a heart open. And as we set before the word, his word goes on the inside of us and his word contains his will. And he fills us with the knowledge of his will. And as we get his word living on the inside of us, we get to know what he wants. Now we always know generally what he wants, but when you begin to get pregnant with the word of God, you begin to get the rhema what God wants. Yeah. And God fills you with the now, this is what I wanna release. 
And when his word gets on the inside of you and is living on the inside of you, out of that place comes a confidence and comes a boldness and a faith to believe that God hears you and that God's moving at the sound of your voice. And so I like to say it this way. When God hears God through you, God moves. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. When God hears God through you, God moves. God creates through his word. And so people ask, what moves God? Because, because if not, if we don't make it about the Bible, then we make it about some unique group out there learning the secret key, finding the puzzle piece. And I'll tell you what moves God. God's word moves God. When God hears God speak through you, he moves. Yeah. So I, I'm real big about John 15, 7, confidence, faith in his word, and all those things. And I believe we've got to get back to praying the Bible. Mm -hmm. We've got to get back to praying the Bible. There are apostolic prayers. There are prophetic decrees. And these are cosigned checks already. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And so it's, I'm a real big proponent on praying the Bible. Yeah. Corey, I, I got to ask you, when, uh, just in reading your book and then even in talking to you, your passion for the Lord is, is just obvious. How have you managed to maintain that <laughs> through all of the years of ministry and, and everything that you've walked through? Yeah, man. That's when I lean back and I love to rest in the fact that he's more committed to me than I am to him. Yeah. And that at the end of the day, he upholds me. I lean into his grace. I lean back into his commitment to me. Because if it's about your commitment to God, you're going you're gonna to run out. But there's got to come a shift in your journey from it being only about your commitment to God into you living out of the overflow of his commitment to you. And I think, and I think, you know, I hit a wall early on in my journey okay. that shifted me from all about my dedication for God into the grace that upholds me and carries me. And I'm leaning into that grace. It's doing all the stuff we know to do. It's staying tender, staying quick repentance, keep showing up. Don't quit. My darkest days show up. My best days I show up. And you just stay with it, knowing that this season's going to pass. Yeah. And, but at the end of the day, I just brag on the grace of God. I brag on him who upholds us and keeps us. It, and, and I'm not going to quit because he's too good. Yeah. Yeah. That's good, man. That's good. Corey, just a few more questions. Uh, then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Uh, Man, this moment that we're in has seen so many disruptions for the church. Uh, if you were to speak into, what do you think? Uh, what do you think are some things God might be doing or saying to the church right now? You, you talked about that right at the beginning, uh, but anything else? Just with so many disruptions, uh, what do you think God might be doing or saying to the church right now? Well, I, you know, I think there's a whole bunch of things going on. I think God's at work. The devil's at work. Yeah. The sin of man is at work. The creation's grown. Yeah. I think we're seeing all kinds of factors at work. God is sovereign. God's over the throne. He, he sits on his throne. And I always love to go 35,000 feet and view it from there and view from God's perspective. I believe ultimately God's been saying through COVID, everybody go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who's in the secret place reconnect with your father. He goes, go into your room and shut the door and everybody just shut up. And so I think for some of that, I think God is, is wanting to begin to, I think it's, so I think it's about a reconnection with God and a reconnection with our brothers and our sisters. I think the racial tension, the pain over our black brothers and sisters, I believe he's wanting to out of pr primarily the white church to get us to shut up. And before we get to all of our statistics and all of our reasons, we actually feel. Wow. And that we don't fix. and We don't try to come up with answers to justify A, B, C through D. But we actually feel. And so I think he's wanting to get our hearts back and get our eyes back. back. It's all about reconnection with God yeah. and see through his lens versus reactive. And, and I, think it, I think many of us, you know, 
I think he's exposing many of us in, in our inability to get there. And so I think God's at work. I think it's a Psalm 91, making God our dwelling place not a, just an occasional ATM we run to when we need a breakthrough, but making him our dwelling place. I believe that we're at the beginning. I believe we're in what the, Jesus called the beginning of birth pangs okay. that will culminate with the return. So I believe that we're seeing the tremors that are signaling the season we're moving into. And, and so I, I think about him from all those levels. I believe the devil's at work and the Lord wants the church to stand in her, in, in her place of prayer and the, you know, and to come forth. And, and I, I believe, in, I've been saying it for a while, that I believe pressure and presence, it delivers us from one, doing Christianity in our own strength. So we need Holy Spirit more. And then number two, it delivers us from our islands and our isolation to where we're going to need each other more. And I think he's driving us into deeper dependence on Holy Spirit and a greater mutual submission with one another. Wow. That's a couple of the thoughts that I'm having. Yeah, just a few. Just yeah. a few. Yeah. You know, one of the things I hear, I, I hear so many people say that this is a moment for the church. Uh, this is a moment. Uh, and, Corey, what, what happens if we miss this moment? Um, you know, I mean, I, I think it's, how God will say you can turn an 11 day journey to Canaan and turn it into 40 years. Wow. They go, there'll be another one coming around the corner. If you don't learn first grade, you can go back and take it again. I think it's going to just, you know, I, I don't know how many, I think there's a Isaiah 55 call out to the Lord while he's near. I don't know how long these gaps last. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think one is you're going to have to learn, take first grade again or two. You're going to be like the wise and the foolish virgins who found the door closed and you didn't take advantage of getting intimacy and hearing his heart. And you were, and I think this is going to happen to many. They're not going to be useful to God in the next season. They may be saved, but they're going to find their ministry lamps dimming and their usefulness go into the backdrop as God begins to bring forth his Davids out of nowhere who are going to become his major agents in the next season. So I think we need to feel the fear of the Lord and take advantage of the moment. But the biggest thing is I, I also go, God says, it's okay. I got all the time in the world. I, I'll wear you down. I'll win this. Yeah. So I see it from both points. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a lot there. You said so many things that, that, uh, that man, I just hope people can hear receive. I want to honor your time. Uh, but Corey, I really hope that our listeners, people who watch this, uh, they'll get connected with you. They'll, they'll take in a lot of the content uh, that, you're, that you're putting out. I know before we begin to record, you talked about a website you're putting a lot of courses on. Can you talk a little bit about that website and what you're doing there? Yeah, man. Um, I, I, two years ago, the Lord really began to press on me. Corey, take your last 20 years of what you've learned in prayer and give it to the next generation. And he really led me to doing it online. I mean, this is way before anything with online. And so I, CoreyRussellOnline.com, CoreyRussellOnline.com is filled with a bunch of online courses that I've been rolling out. So we're just finishing up Sermon on the Mount actually tonight with our last live session. But then I'm starting one called Pursuit of the Holy, which is around the beauty of God at the end of August. It's a three-week course with around 12 to 15 uh, sessions. And then we'll do three one-hour live sessions to where I'll just kind of unpack some of the things in them. But you go to CoreyRussellOnline.com, and then my big one that I've been going after is a 40 Days Teach Us to Pray course, 40 Days of Shifting Your Prayer Life into a New Place in God. And I think we'll do our next one in probably the beginning of October. And we even have ones recorded from a previous seasons that you can get. So that, I've got a book called Teach Us to Pray coming out at the end of the year. I got a bunch of stuff on... Uh, you know, and I got, I've written, this is my sixth book I've written and I've done five prayer albums. I'm going to do another uh, prayer album and all that kind of stuff. So I'm just wanting to equip people in connection to God. And so that's one of the big ways that you can partner and join in with me. And my website's CoreyRussell.org. Awesome.
Awesome. Well, Corey, you, you are a gift to the church. Thank you for your voice. Thank you for how you're speaking and just your willingness to man, just to equip, just to equip the next generation, man. God bless you. God bless you, man. Thank you.